All right, uh, warm welcome to uh, Sunday, 7 a.m. Solid Scripture Study. Uh, this is a study of God's Word uh, with Duke Jairaj. Uh, and right now, I want to uh, you to close your eyes as we start this day's study. Shall we close our eyes? Gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful Sunday. We thank you for this Sunday, 7 a.m. Solid Scripture Study. Even as we continue our study on how to understand modern false teachings and how to discern them and how to escape from them, how to warn fellow believers about them, I pray that you'll be with us as we talk about uh, the broader subject of immortality and the subject of uh, also understanding how to interpret the Bible, how to escape from false teachings. I pray that you'll speak to us even as I use the A of the acronym death to counter the uh, Lord hell populating immortality on earth teaching that is so popular in South India and in countries like Sri Lanka, South Africa and spreading thick and fast around the globe. This teaching which tells our young generation you don't have to die so that uh, and you are going to be immortal uh, when the Bible clearly teaches otherwise. I pray that as we counter it from the word of God, I pray that Lord as a remnant will understand this truth and escape these false teachings and become Lord advocates for sound doctrine, O oh Lord. We thank you. In Jesus Christ now I pray. Amen. Okay, let me pick up the Bible. And uh, I'm going to start today. Uh, we will continue this series that I have done. In fact, I've finished two messages in this series where I use the acronym death to counter the immortality on earth false teaching. Okay, uh, there was to be a conference April 28th to 30th, 2020 featuring four popular preachers, all right, uh, where they would be teaching about immortality on earth. It was widely advertised, but the conference did not take place. But nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to counter this in the light of God's word because this is a, a hell-populating uh, false teaching. We have finished uh, uh, two studies in the series, and this is the third study. And we are using the acronym DEATH and this is on the, uh, on the letter A. The study is on the letter A. Uh, now, before I start, I want to begin with uh, 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 by acknowledging the impact of Dr. Ravi Zacharias upon my life. Dr. Ravi Zacharias has had a great impact in my life. Uh, he went to be with Jesus a few days ago, as did David Paulson, another man of God. What a great impact in my life. Uh, uh, I have written about them on Facebook and on my uh, website dukewords.com so I want you to read them if you read the, that article and that, the, that appreciation those appreciation that they wrote on these two websites but I want to begin this study on immortality on earth this study on larger study on how to interpret the Bible with a Ravi Zacharias funny story in fact it's part of a video that I, uh, which I saw recently, Ravi Zakaria's 18 Funny Stories, Part 1. It's on YouTube. I recommend that you take time to watch it. Uh, you will have a smile, but more than a smile, you'll be also thinking in the right direction. Uh, Ravi Zakaria's 18 Funny Stories, Part 1. And this is from the 15th, uh, 15th minute, 24th second onwards. It's an amazing story. Okay. Uh, a Sunday school teacher asked Sam, Well, Sam, Will you tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan? Well, Sam, would you tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan? Yes, sir, I will. Gladly I will, said Sam. And he went on. Once there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked him. And as he went on his way, he didn't have no money. And there he met the queen of Sheba and she gave him a thousand talents and hundred changes of raiment. 
and he got into a chariot and drove furiously when he was driving under a big juniper tree. His hair got caught when he was driving under a big juniper tree. His hair got caught on the limb of that tree and he hung there for many days. And there the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. One night when he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut off his hair and he dropped and he fell on stony ground. And, but he got up and went on and it began to rain and it rained and rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave and he lived on locusts and wild honey. And then and he went on till he met a servant who said, come take supper in my house. And he made excuse and said, no, I won't. I married a wife. I can't go. And then and the servant went on into the highways and into the hedges and compelled him to come in. After supper, he went in and came down to Jericho. And when he got there, he looked up and there that old queen Jezebel sitting down up high in the window. She laughed at him and he said, throw her down out there. And they threw her down and, and he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times 7. And of the fragments that remained, they picked up 12 basketfuls besides women and children. And they said, blessed are the peacemakers, P-I-E-C-E. -E. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, whose wife do you think she will be on that judgment day? So much uh, when Sam was asked by a Sunday school teacher to narrate the story of the good Samaritan. All right. As you are smiling away, you know, I want to repeat Dr. Ravi Zakharis' comment. And you see this in this video, post narrating the story. And that's what is very important. Not just not the joke, but what he says after the joke. Okay. It says, that's brilliant, great story, wrong context. And you know what? I think a day is going to come when people won't even laugh at this story. Now, hear me good. YouTube audience, Facebook audience, Instagram audience. Okay, hear me good. A day is going to come when people won't even laugh at a story like this uh, because they won't know what is so funny about it. They will not know enough of the biblical narrative. Here, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. They will not know enough of the biblical narrative in order to see the messed up context of this, crea this creative genius has done. So this Sunday school boy has messed up the context and mixed up so many different stories and come up with a fantastic story. But a few days down the line or a few months down the line, a few years down the line, or even right now, I would say, people will not even know what is funny about such a story because they do not know enough of the Bible narrator. They do not know enough of the Bible narrator. That is a sad thing. And we have teachings like immortality on earth because people do not know the Bible narrative. They do not know the full story of the Bible. So help populating false teachers and false pastors cultic pastors take advantage of this situation advantage of the situation that you you are listening to me right now do not spend enough time reading the bible so they take advantage of that they take advantage of that and that is a sad thing so i've been using the acronym death to counter this immortality on earth teaching the first word was uh, direct teaching, D, direct teaching from the Bible against the immortality cult. Uh, I want to just quickly recap. And uh, when I recap, I want to also present some fresh material. I, un, uh, I studied uh, because I go back to my notes and uh, I try to update them. And I keep thinking because till I die, till the return of Jesus, I want to be growing in the Lord. So direct teaching from the Bible against the immortality cult, D, Okay, I, I, I read, I read A.W. Pink, okay, one of the 
uh, 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 one of my favorite authors, and I recommend that you read the writings of A.W. Pink. He wrote a book in the year 1930 on the character of God. You can Google A.W. Pink, the character of God, and you can get this PDF freely. Okay, and the, his first character of God, as he explains the character of God in the Bible. First of all, he explains why we must study the character of God. And he says in Daniel 11.32, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, if you're watching me, if you'd like to help our readers come, who are coming along, uh, who might come to this uh, presentation later on, you can put on the references. Uh, you could uh, write down my main points as comments. Okay, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 says, the people that do not know their God, that do know their God will be strong. So if you want to, do you want to be a strong Christian? You must know God. Knowing God will make you a strong Christian. A people who know their God. The people, the people that do know their God will be strong. Shall be strong. And the first character of God that A.W. Pink mentions is the solitariness of God. Solitariness. That was there is our God is unique. There is no one else like him. I'm, of course, I'm referring to the Trinity, God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. He is solitary in that sense. There is no one else like him. He can't be replicated. He can't be replicated. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11 says, God is uh, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises. Doing wonders, Exodus 15, 11. There's no one like him. He is the solitariness of God. Even Dr. Zacharias confirmed that. One of his stories, uh, he, where he talks about writing his uh, exam, a, theo a theology exam with his wife sitting beside him. Um, and the exam concerned who was God. And the question was uh, about who was God. He said, God is the only entity uh, for whom the purpose for existence exists within himself. God is the only entity, the purpose for whose exist exists within himself. For all other entities, every one of us, the purpose for entity exists outside of ourselves. And our purpose for existence exists in God. All right. So when I say direct teaching from the Bible counters immortality on earth, I refer to 1 Timothy 6.16. 1 Timothy 6.16, where the Bible says, God who alone has immortality. So, you know, I, I, I am baffled. I believe our believers who follow this teaching don't even know basic scripture. And scripture is so clear. Okay. First Timothy 6.16 says, God alone has immortality who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be the honor, glory, uh, whom, to, me, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. He alone is immortal. Direct teaching from the Bible against immortality on earth. And uh, not just that, we also have another, other, other passages which directly teach against immortality. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 1 and 2. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, we know that if the tent that is in our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. Paul is using figurative language. Paul is using uh, a metaphor here. We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, he's talking about his own, he's comparing human bodies to tents. We know if the tent that is our earthly body is destroyed, destroyed, dies. If this tent that we live in, the human body that we live in, if it's destroyed, if it dies, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he says, don't worry, even if you die, even if this earthly tent that you live in, which is your body, if that is destroyed, don't worry, because you have a building from God, a house not made with hands, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on a heavenly dwelling. He's talking about uh, his desire and he's, his, he wants the believers to have the same desire because he says we groan. 
uh, he he's including the believers, uh, the particularly worldly believers of Corinth, cut, uh, believers of Corinth who are given to fleshly addictions. And this is the Pastor Paul's desire for them. For we groan, longing on to put the heavenly dwelling. So Apostle Paul says, if you are a true believer, growing believer, maturing believer, you will actually long to put on your heavenly dwelling. 2 Corinthians 5.2 You will not long to live in this world for long. That, that will not be long. Of course, when you, you will make every day count, every second count. Uh, I'm trying to make this day count for God. And this is my first life. And at, at 4.30, I have another program. And these days, I, after my family goes to sleep, I am staying back and writing articles uh, starting at, say, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, going all the way up to 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, however long I'm able to awake because I, I believe my time in this world is less, so I need to make it count. But at the same time, I groan, longing to put on my heavenly dwelling. Longing to put on my heavenly dwelling. So, D-E-A-T-H. Okay, we are using the acronym DEATH to understand why we cannot believe in cults like immortality on earth. Direct teaching from the Bible against immortality on earth. And then, the, uh, I already have a full video on this, so you, can, you might want to check that on my YouTube uh, channel. And the second letter, examples from the Bible against immortality and cult, uh, on, against cult, examples. I quoted the example of, the, uh, of James's death in Acts chapter 12. He was put to death. He was a full. He was in full-time ministry. He was an important member of the Jesus gang, and uh, here was James put to death. And Luke, the writer of Acts, if if it was a scandal, the death of James was a scandal. Okay, he would have at least had a note. Okay, that the early church believed in immortality on earth, but unfortunately, for some strange reason, James died. But Luke just carries on. The death of James is recorded. This is after Jesus died on the cross and rose again. After Jesus ascended to the Father. After Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father. After Jesus started to pray for each one of us. So this is post-cross. James died. Examples from the Bible against immortality on earth. Cut. Okay. D-E-A. Okay. So today. Okay. Already I'm done around 15 minutes of preaching. Uh, I want to limit this teachings to about one hour. Uh, uh, so I have another 45 minutes to sh share God's word. Okay, and I'm going to mainly talk about this today. D-E-A, announcements in the New Testament about immortality on earth. Uh, okay, so these announcements, if we studied in the right way and not the, the way the cultic false pastors you know, teach it. If you interpret these announcements correctly, announcements in the New Testament about immortality correctly, we'll understand we will become immortal after the return of Jesus, not before the return of Jesus. So I'm talking about the announcements in the New Testament about immortality on earth. And as I study these passages, we'll also underline some important principles of Bible interpretation. All right. Okay. The first announcement, it comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 23 to 26. Uh, a particular Chennai pastor makes a big deal about this passage. And in fact, he has famously, he has famously said that unless... A generation rises in the church that beats death. Jesus will not return back to this earth. If some of you are exposed to these teachings uh, for the first time, I want to repeat myself. There is a Chennai pastor who says, unless the, there's a, a generation in our churches which believes that we will not die, that we are immortal on earth, Jesus will not return. That is his teaching. And he quotes 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 26. Let us read it. I want to read it from the ESV version. Okay, it says, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 onwards. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. If you have a highlighter, please underline the word, phrase, circle the phrase, verse 23. At his coming, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, okay, when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his 
feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay, look at verse 25. All his enemies are at his feet. Who is he there? Jesus. And where are the enemies of Jesus? At his feet. Okay, this particular Chennai pastor says, okay, first, first Corinthians 15, 25 says, uh, the enemies of Jesus will be under his feet. Okay, and then he jumps to another passage uh, somewhere else, first Corinthians 12, 27 and says, you are the body of Christ. Okay, that passage is not even saying you are the feet of Christ. It says you are the body of Christ. So the feet is part of Jesus' body. And the, where are the enemies? They are at this feet. You are the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Okay, the feet is part of Jesus' body. So who is going to, uh, and verse 26, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So because the next verse says the last enemy to be destroyed is death, he says the body of Jesus, which is actually represented here in this passage by the legs of Jesus, which is actually believers, okay, that they will defeat death. I think this is a bizarre, bizarre, crazy interpretation of scripture. It is an assassination of the Bible text. It is a rape of the context. It is not right. Not right. So this mistake is what Bible interpreters call, true Bible interpreters call as wrong combination. When you employ the principle of wrong combination and interpret the Bible, you will always make a mistake. For example, a man opened the Bible and, and he opened, he flipped the Bible open and his eyes fell on Matthew 27 and verse 5, part of Matthew 27 and verse 5. Judas went and hung himself and then he closed his Bible and then he opened the Bible again and his eyes fell on Luke 10, 37. Okay, first he read Matthew 27, 5 and he, next where it said Jesus, uh, Judas went and hung himself. And then he read Luke chapter 10 verse 37 where it, where it says, you go and do likewise. And he closed his Bible. Judas went and hung himself. You go and do likewise. And then he opened the Bible again. John 13, 27. What you're about to do, do quickly. So if you open the Bible and interpret the Bible using this wrong combination method, okay, even suicide can be defended. It is a suicidal way of Bible interpretation. It is a terribly wrong way of Bible interpretation. Okay. For example, let me give you another example of wrong combination. Okay. Uh, somebody flips up on the Bible and his eyes fall on Matthew 10, 11. Matthew 10, 11. Okay. It says, when you go into the city or village, look for people who listen to you. When you go into the city or village, look for people. Okay. And then you, cl you close the Bible and you open the Bible again and your eyes fall on Deuteronomy 13.5. Deuteronomy 13.5. And Deuteronomy 13.5 says, You must kill the residents of the city with swords and destroy that city and everyone in it. Luke Mark 10.11 says, You must go into the city. You close the Bible and you open the Bible again. And you look at uh, Deuteronomy 13.5. It says, You must kill the residents of that city. So is the Bible saying, You must go into the city of Mumbai and destroy everybody in Mumbai? Will the Bible support a terrorist attack? Okay, it can be made to support a terrorist attack if you follow the wrong principle of uh, interpreting the Bible, which is wrong combination. This is not the way to interpret the Bible. If you interpret the Bible like that, you are raping the Bible. You are you are, you are violating the Bible. You are dishonoring God. You are not handling the word of truth in the proper way. Okay. All right. Now, I want you to look at that scripture again. And we are looking at the scriptures uh, uh, announcements in the New Testament about immortality. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 26 is what we are studying. Okay. And this passage is very clear. Who, who must reign? Jesus will reign. Who will destroy death? Jesus himself will destroy death. And when will he destroy it? Okay. First Corinthians 15, 23 says, At his coming. 
the plain when the plain meaning of the bible makes sense don't look for some other meaning it's very clear at his coming first corinthians 15 23 jesus will destroy the last enemy death which is verse 26 first corinthians 15 26 it's very very clear and not just that okay if you look elsewhere in the bible and see the back passage in context this is what repeatedly the Bible teaches. For example, in the book of Daniel, I want you to look at the book of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, my wife and I have been uh, reading a lot of Bible, especially during lockdown. Uh, of course, uh, we've been, we, do, we do read the Bible on a regular basis, uh, but especially more during the lockdown. And we thank God for the extended time that we get at home. Uh, and one of the things that I have been doing is that... Uh, since there are 22 chapters in Revelation and since from chapter 7 to chapter 12 of Daniel, okay, is also Revelation like 7 to 12 uh, and approximately we have about, uh, you know, 28 to 30 chapters, okay, of uh, heavy material, apocalyptic literature as theologians call it. I've been trying to read one chapter from apocalyptic literature. For example, if it's the date is uh, 1st to 22nd of a month, I stay in Revelation and then 23rd onwards, I switch to uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7 onwards and I read all the way to 12th. So this way, every month and every day, I get an exposure to apocalyptic literature because I want to be able to interpret it correctly, understand what God is saying to us in these last days correctly. So I recommend that you try that. Okay, I know you... Uh, you'd read book of Psalms, uh, five chapters a day. You can complete Psalms. I know some of us read Acts, okay, which is very good. Uh, we, living the, we are living the days of the book of Acts. Some of us read Proverbs. We go to work and we need wisdom at our workplace. Uh, so we read Proverbs, which approximately has got uh, the same number of chapters as the number of months. But this is different. Uh, okay, and this is something I'm, it came to my mind. I thought I would share it with you because I, at the end of the day, I want to see each one of us grow in the Lord and become strong disciples of Jesus and accurate preachers of the word. Uh, that is what I, I desire for each one of us. And that is what I believe God desires for each one of us. So Revelation 22 plus uh, Daniel's chapter 5, 27 chapters of apocalyptic literature. If we can read one chapter a day, okay, and if we can keep reading it every month in a cycle like that, Okay, then the, the repeated reading and reflection will give us the right interpretation of these passages. Okay, from Daniel chapter 7. Okay, Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14. Okay, what I'm saying is Daniel 7, 13 and 14 gives us the order very clearly. Jesus returns and after that we have everlasting life. We have eat. That means we have immortality. Okay. The word used there is everlasting. Immortality is not used. All right. Daniel chapter seven uh, verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven that comes one like the son of man. And he came to the ancient of days. So coming down the clouds is the son of man. Okay. Coming down the clouds. Daniel seven thirteen is the son of man. So after he comes, verse 14, Daniel 7, 14, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So I'm understanding from Daniel 7, 13 and 14, Jesus returns first, verse 13, and verse 14, then we have the gift of immortality or everlasting life or a, a, we will rule this world in an everlasting uh, a manner. So that's one thing that's very, very clear. And again, uh, this is repeated in Daniel 7.22 where we read about the second coming. Let me read Daniel chapter 7 and verse 22. It's a, it's a beautiful chapter, book of Daniel chapter 7. Let me open up my Bible to Daniel chapter 7. All right, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 22. Again, another uh, verse about the second coming of Jesus. The Bible is a remarkable book. In the, in the time when Daniel was written, when even the first coming did not take place, the Bible talks about the second coming. Daniel chapter 7 verse 22, uh, the Bible says, Until the ancient of days, there the name for Jesus is ancient of days. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. Okay, ancient of the days 
came, he came his second coming judgment for the saints of the most high day of judgment and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom so after the day of judgment after the second coming of Jesus that's when the saints possess the kingdom which means they have immortal lives of course uh, we in a sense we only have the kingdom the new testament talks about it when demons are cast the kingdom of god is there but the bible also says the kingdom will come when jesus standing before the religious leaders said you will see me come down which means his kingdom has come and he it will come already but not yet and here daniel 7:22 says after the return after the ancient days of days come uh, came the judgment will be given was given for the saints of the most high and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom and verse 26 and 27 of daniel daniel 7 26 and 27 but the court shall sit in judgment again uh, here the second coming is not specifically mentioned but the day of judgment is mentioned okay uh, because I twice already the second coming is mentioned uh, Daniel 7:26 the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the uh, uh, to the end and the kingdom and the dominion the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the saints of the most high and their king kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom I know sometimes in the interpretation these scriptures look a little heavy and we might make the odd mistake but I don't want any of us to make the big mistake of you know getting it all wrong by teaching things like you will not die before the return of Jesus Christ so i believe daniel chapter 7 verse 27 clearly says uh when we read the whole chapter that after the return of jesus after the ancient of days comes and after he comes in the clouds as we saw in one of the verses then an everlasting kingdom will be established and the saints will start ruling with jesus and they also because it's an everlasting kingdom they also will have a everlasting life all right so that's the that's the that's one way to uh, that's you know if we have understood the message of daniel 7 then we will not mess it up in first corinthians 15 and we will not also mess up the interpretation in first corinthians 15 if you have understood matthew chapter 25 matthew chapter 25 it says okay matthew 25 and verse 37 when the son of man comes in his glory Okay, Matthew twenty-five, verse thirty-one. Uh, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, again, if you have a highlighter, please mark. It's talking about the return of Jesus. Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, and He will sit on His glorious throne. Now, the Bible is talking about this repeatedly. Jesus will come, and there's going to be a big day of judgment. Okay, and that is Matthew twenty-five and verse thirty-one. And what happens? Look at verse forty-six. Matthew twenty-five and verse forty-six. and the and these will go away into eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal life so when will the righteous have eternal life when will the believers have eternal life verse 46 of matthew 25 is very clear it is after the return of jesus christ not before that but the righteous to eternal life and then this is again repeated okay we will not mess up our interpretation of first corinthians 15 if we have understood the message of first corinthians chapter 4 where uh, the uh, apostle paul says we do not first uh, corinthians 4:13 we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that means those who die that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope verse 14 for since we believe jesus died and rose again even so though through jesus god will bring with him those who have fallen asleep for this we declare to you by the word of god that those who are alive who are left until the coming of the lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep and verse 16 is very important uh, the, for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of the command with the voice of the archangel with the sound of the trumpet call of god and the dead in christ will rise first then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so we will be with the lord therefore encourage each other with these with, your, with these words uh, uncle david possen who went to be with jesus uh, like many respected bible teachers believed in one second coming not rapture uh, and second coming but one second coming okay uh, and he would quote this verse to talk about the second coming as he quoted uh, as he would say Matthew 25 talks about the one second coming first Thessalonians chapter 
Ford talks about one second coming. Uh, and I believe there is, uh, uh, we must consider uh, this view as well, though many of us believe in rapture and first and then the second coming. That's a big, that's a big issue. I'm not going to get into that. But my topic today is, okay, whether you believe in rapture or whether, and second coming or you believe in one second coming, it doesn't matter here in this context because uh, this cultic group says Jesus will not return until a generation of believers believes in immortality. I'm saying Jesus will return, whether it's rapture or whether it's second public second coming, Jesus will return. Jesus will return after which, okay, verse 18, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Therefore, uh, okay, verse 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, and uh, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord always, which means we will not die. If we are with the Lord always, that means we will not die. When will that happen? When he returns to see us in the clouds or when he returns again, when during the second coming or during the rapture or whichever view of second coming you believe, that doesn't really matter in this context. So, the wrong interpretation of 1 Corinthians 15 is righted by when you look at other passages, one in the Old Testament, Daniel 7, one in the Gospels, Matthew 25, and one in the Epistles, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So that is how you also formulate doctrine. When you formulate doctrine as much as possible, look for material from different portions of Scripture from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. And especially you need to look for material in the epistles because um, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, easy to remember. The biblical warrant is we must follow Christ as Apostle Paul, or, uh, Apostle Paul followed Christ or as the apostles followed Christ. So even how we interpret Jesus and his ministry, the model should be the apostles. If the apostles did not do a certain kind of miracle, I wouldn't be comfortable pursuing that kind of miracle in my ministry because our absolute model is the apostles. And they said that it's just one time, another four times if you do the study and do the cross references, five times in the in the epistles, Romans to Revelation, five times by Apostle Paul himself, you know, uh, words for Apostle Paul himself, in spite of the Holy Spirit, he'll say, follow me as I follow Christ using different words. So they are the model. And Apostle Paul is very clear. Jesus returns in the clouds. And uh, before that, many people can die. Uh, he's talking about that there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16. But if we are alive, we'll be caught up together with them. And we will live with them forever, which means we will be given the gift of immortality. We will be, we will be with him forever, rule with him for, forever. So it's very clear. Let's, that's very clear. It's very clear. And though I again uh, say, I'm, and you, some of you have seen my Bible studies on the book of Revelation, I would not uh, teach a Bible teaching uh, doctrine, which is only solely supported by the book of Revelation. But since we have so much of support in, uh, for this teaching from Matthew 25, from 1 Thessalonians 4, from Daniel chapter 7, uh, I want to say that re even the Revelation supports this because Revelation 11, 19, 11 talks about the return of Jesus. Okay, the white horse, Jesus riding in a white horse. And Revelation 22 and verse 4, uh, 22 and verse 4. Let, can we read Revelation 22 and verse 4? Revelation 19, 11 and Revelation 22 and verse 4. Let me read that. Okay, again, Revelation 19, 11 talks about Revelation 19 and verse 11 talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then I saw the heaven open, behold a white horse and the one sitting on it was called faithful and true. So the second coming and then Revelation 22 and verse 4 says, No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb. And uh, sorry, Revelation 22 and verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and, their, and night shall be will be no more they will they need no lamp or sun for the lord will be their light and they shall reign forever and forever verse 5 they shall reign forever and forever after the second coming not before that 
Okay, so that's the that's the thing. Okay, so we are studying the letter A uh, under the acronym DEATH to understand what the Bible teaches about immortality on earth. So we are formulating Bible teaching against this cultic teaching. Uh, so we are in the acronym A. This is the third series of that uh, of this of the study. Okay, so we are looking at another announcement of immortality, which comes in First Corinthians 15, the latter part. Uh, verse 50 onwards. I want to read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 50 onwards. It says, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on imperishable and this mortal body should put on immortality. So the Bible makes an announcement about immortality in 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this perishable body must put on imperishable and this mortal body should put on immortality. Okay, and verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then... It sh then shall come to pass this saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So death is defeated. So death is defeated. We have become immortal. When? Verse 52 is very clear. When the trumpet will sound. Okay, now these false teachers, help populating heretic false, false teachers, you know, they take advantage of the word trumpet here uh, because there is no explicit reference to second coming attached to the trumpet. You know, they try to say they, their conference they were supposed to have on April 28th onwards, 2020 uh, through 30th in a location in Chennai, uh, the, the four of them. So they, their preaching is the trumpet. That's what they teach. Absolutely heretic. See, I want to tell you, our whims and fancy, our, our fanciful interpretations, our imaginative interpretations. Now, they will lead us astray and they will take us straight to hell. And they will, and if our church believes in our lives, even our church believers will go to hell. So we need to be very careful the, how we interpret scripture. Okay, how do we interpret the word trumpet? Okay, how do we interpret the word trumpet? So I think the easy way to interpret the word trumpet is to ask, did Apostle Paul use the word trumpet in his other letters? And you go to a website like Bible Gateway and type trumpet and choose ESV, the uh, uh, a fairly reliable version as the translation to search from. And you will land again in first. There's only one time Paul used trumpet apart from this place. Okay, in his letters, in his 13 letters. And that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. And... In what context is it used? It's, it's talking about the trumpet call of God, the sound of the trumpet call of God, the voice of the archangel, the cry of command, and how the dead in Christ will rise first and how Jesus is going to come back in the clouds to take us. So the only time Apostle Paul uses the trumpet other than this particular place is in the context of the second coming. So it makes very good sense to understand the trumpet call of God uh, a trumpet which is mentioned in 1st Corinthians chapter 50 after which uh, 15 uh, 50 50 onwards 15 50 onwards all the way to 55 the trumpet in that passage uh, which must precede we becoming immortal or we become clothed with immortality is the trumpet call that 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 comes before the second coming of Jesus so the right interpretation is the second coming trumpet will be sounded, not your preaching, not your cultic preaching. That's not the trumpet. Okay, the second coming trumpet, because we must interpret scripture with scripture. And if possible, if we are interpreting Paul, we must interpret Paul with his own writings. Because, uh, we don't, because the Holy Spirit is speaking through him, he is not confused. He is writing clearly. So when Paul is writing about trumpet and he has not connected with trumpet with second coming in 1 Corinthians 15, we must ask where else he has written about trumpet. And there's only one reference and that's 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and there the trumpet clearly connects it with the second coming of Jesus. 
There's another time the word trumpet comes in the epistles and that is in Hebrews chapter 12. Last Sunday, my study was on Hebrews chapter 12. If you've not listened to that study, we studied four reasons from Hebrews chapter 12 calling us for practical daily holiness. Uh, thank you for joining me in that study. But there, there is one passage, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 19. Okay, it says the sound of the trumpet and a voice whose words made hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Okay, so there the trumpet in that place talks about an Old Testament story that already took place. So it cannot be that trumpet. So it's talking about a historical event. What historical event? Exodus chapter 19, uh, where if you read, I, wanted, I recommended you read Exodus chapter 19 at leisure, where Moses goes up to the Mount, uh, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Or Gebel Musa, okay, how you call it, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, or Gebel Musa, to receive the Ten Commandments of God, that mountain which is called the Mountains of God, and the people who are waiting below the mountain. And there, there is a reference, there, there's a reference to a trumpet, okay, in Exodus 19.13, Exodus 19.16, and Exodus 19.19, Exodus 19.13, 19.16, 19.13. 1919. Exodus 1913, 1916, 1919. Read these three references to trumpet, which mention, which is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about this historic event which is taking place in Exodus 19. Three trumpets. And if you will un clearly read it, you'll understand that the Bible does not specifically say that uh, the human sound of the trumpet and in respected Bible scholars, including Eben Ezra, okay, Eben Ezra is a famous uh, Bible scholar, a Jewish Bible commentator uh, uh, who lived, who died in the year 1164. His uh, commentary on the Pentateuch is supposed to be one of the finest. And he says the trumpet in Exodus chapter 19, because the scriptures does not say that the people sounded it, okay, they said it was the, again the angel who sounded it. So the, even in the the only other time the Bible talks about uh, trumpets, uh, apart from the book of Revelation, okay, the epistles, okay, and I said we cannot make formulation of doctrine exclusively based on Revelation uh, because it's written in symbolic language. So it has to be supported from what is clearly mentioned in chapters one, uh, book number one to book number 65 of the Bible. Uh, so uh, we cannot claim, teach something absolutely new, which is only found in the book of Revelation. Because that is written in symbolic language. Okay, now, so so he says, if you carefully read Exodus 19.19, at the, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder, that's Exodus 19.19. And look at 19.16, 19.13. It says, it's talking about the sound. It's not clear about the origin. And comment, some Jewish commentators, including the famous Eben Ezra, say it is the, the angel sound of the trumpet. So there is no basis even in this passage, to say that human preaching can anyway be the uh, be the trumpet of God, as these cultic hell populating for false teachers or false pastors say, they say human preaching that they say that the conference that they are going to conduct uh, or the preaching that they do about immortality. So that is the trumpet, and then so that is the trumpet, and people have to believe, listen to the trumpet that is their false teaching concerning immortality on earth, and believe we will not die, we will not die, and you know this is rubbish. This is not what the Bible says. Even the Exodus 19 trumpet was sounded by the angels, not by human beings. Let's not uh, fool people by twisting scriptures. Let's correctly interpret the Bible. Let's correctly interpret the Bible. All right. And now that brings me to another major uh, uh, theme that they use to announce immortality on earth. So for these false teachers, immortality on earth is announced by Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. And again, they refer to two passages. And I want to mention this and close today. Okay. They mention two passages uh, where the Bible talks about the substitutionary death. And, and they basically their argument goes like this. Jesus died. We should die. But Jesus died on our behalf. So because Jesus died on our behalf, we don't have to die. Okay. That is their false teaching. That is their cultic false teaching. Let me explain that, okay? First passage they quote for this is 2 Corinthians 5, 14. It says, one has died for all, therefore all died. Now, 
the Madurai uh, cultic false pastor would say, uh, yeah, uh, Hebrews 9.27 says man is destined to die once. Uh, yes, man is destined to die once, but I have already died. When did I die? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, one has died for all, therefore all died. Because Jesus died, I also died, you know, so on and so forth. But this is a wrong interpretation. I'll tell you why it's wrong interpretation. Okay, see the next verse. Okay, see the next verse. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5.15. So we must read the Bible in context. Otherwise, we, we will start to believe in false teaching and cultic false teaching. 2 Corinthians 5.15, the very next verse. Okay, uh, one has died for all, therefore all have died. That is 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. And he has died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. There is a spiritual meaning to the life that Jesus has given you because of what he did for you on the cross. That those who live should not live for themselves. Jesus died on the cross to deliver us from selfish lifestyle. So that is the thrust of this passage. I'm not saying that because Jesus died on the cross, I will eventually be immortal. Yes, I will be eventually be immortal after the return of Jesus. Uh, but here and now, I don't have the gift of immortality. I am. I believe my body, I, just like Dr. Ravi Zacharias died at the age of nine, 74 and uh, David Pawson died at the age of 90, uh, Duke Jairaj, if the return of Jesus is delayed, might die at age XX. I don't know when, how old I will live. 45 I, I am. But what do passages like 2 Corinthians 5, okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 teach me? Okay, Jesus died for me and I died in Jesus and I live now. Live for what? Okay, I, I died to self, uh, selfish living. 2 Timothy 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves for him who for whose sake died and was raised. So the meaning is spiritual. So let us not make it, uh, let us not give another twist to it. Okay, which, and this is not one place where the apostles, where here Apostle Paul, you know, talks about the spiritual meaning of Jesus' substitutionary death where he stresses on a spiritual meaning. Okay, let me give you two scriptures. Galatians 2.20, where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Same thing. Je I died, Jesus died. Jesus died, I died. I have been crucified with Christ. Jesus died, I also died. I have been crucified with Christ. So I died, Jesus died, so I am immortal. Paul could have easily taught that, but that, that's not what he taught. He's giving a, bringing a spiritual meaning. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So I live and Christ lives with me, in me. Which means this day which God has given me, I need to demonstrate the fact that Christ is living in me. The way I relate to my wife, the way I relate to my children, the way I relate to people I talk on the phone uh, must be the way Christ will respond to them, the way Christ will respond to them. But Christ who lives in me, I have been crucified with Christ, I died with Jesus for what? So that the life of Christ, the spiritual life of Christ will be lived through me, not here, it's not used to teach immortality in this context. And in Galatians 5.24, it's even more clearer. Galatians 5.24. And those who belong to Jesus, Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. So Jesus died. You know, here again, Paul can say Jesus died on the cross. So you can, you are immortal. He doesn't say that. Jesus died on the cross and you are crucified with him. You died alongside with him. Why? So that you will crucify the flesh with his passions and his desires. The desire that we have to watch porn, to the desire that we have to express sinful anger, the desire that we have to be lazy, okay, and to give extra sleep to our body, all those sinful desires we know we must overcome because we have been crucified with Christ. The meaning is spiritual. The meaning is spiritual. Let's not forget that. I'm not saying that because Jesus died on the cross. I have immortal. I will eventually have immortality, but that, as we have 
already studied is coming after the return of Jesus, not before the return of Jesus. All right. And also Paul elaborately writes about the certainty of death in Corinthians, the same book which they quote uh, to bring the substitution argument. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses eight through 12. We must read second Corinthians chapter four, eight through 10 and 12. And you must understand that. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 onwards. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Stuck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying the, in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Okay? For we are living... We are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is work is at work with us in us, but life in you. So if you read that part, part of scripture, what that part of scripture is saying is the apostles were ready to die, ready to put their lives at risk, so that the life of Jesus will be manifest in these churches that they planted. They are willing to face death because what is the worst thing that can happen in, uh, when you preach the gospel? People can kill you for preaching the gospel. But the apostles are fine with that because that they know that's only going to give them uh, a, a promotion to eternal life. Literal eternal life. So they were not scared. And not just that, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 1 and 2, for we know, as I read the scripture at the start of the study, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, for we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house that is not made with hands, eternal in his heavens. So again, using the imagery of a tent, referring to the body, he says the tent can be destroyed, but there's an eternal home waiting for us. So, in the book of Corinthians, very clear, direct teaching is there uh, talking about uh, uh, the, our mortality or possibility of death. Possibility of death. And Apostle Paul, who penned the words, who also wrote Romans, uh, he writes in Romans chapter 8, 35 onwards, 35 to 39. It, list of things that can't separate a person from Christ, he includes death. He didn't believe in immortality on earth. If he believed in immortality or not, he would never include death as the list, as in the list of things that cannot separate him from the love of Christ. So Apostle Paul did not believe in immortality on earth. And in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, okay, speaking to the Ephesian elders in Pavel's speech, Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, but I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord. He, didn't, he said, I do not count my life of any value. If I have to finish what Jesus sent me to this world to finish, Jesus sent me to this world to grab the Google generation from, from going to Gehenna. Jesus sent Ravi Zacharias to this world to make the thinkers Believers think and the thinkers believe. Make believers think, make believers apologists and thinkers, the, the, the skeptics, the thinkers believe in Jesus. That was his purpose. And Paul says he can fulfill the purpose for which God sent him. And in, in case he has to even lose his life for that, no problem. That's what he says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. And he says the same thing in Acts chapter 21 and verse 13. Acts 21 and verse 13, where he says, Why are you, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but also even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Even die. So Apostle Paul was ready to die. If you believe in immortality on earth, he won't be writing all these words. All right. And there's another passage that they quote uh, using the same argument. Jesus died, so we don't have to die. And that passage is Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Okay, now I want you to understand the larger message of the Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 36 onwards. Okay, Hebrews 11, 36 to 40. Okay, it's talking about the possibility of death for church believers. Hebrews 11, 36. So that, their interpretation of Hebrews 9, 28 is wrong because Hebrews 11, 36 onwards talks about the possibility of death. 
uh, for believers. Others suffered, Hebrews 11, 36. Others suffered mocking and flocking, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawn in two and they were killed with a sword. They were killed. Hebrews 11, 36 talks about possibility of death for believers. He book of Hebrews is not teaching immortality on earth. And verse 39 says they and all these, including the people who died, were commended for their faith. So the Holy Spirit, the writer of these words said, you have faith. It's not because of lack of faith they died. Because of, not because of lack of faith that cancer didn't get healed and they died. Not because of lack of faith. The Holy Spirit here, the Bible says they were commended for their faith. They were commended. Hebrews 11.39 And verse 40 says, since God has provided something better for us. So better, now some people will argue for Hebrews 11 is about Old Testament saints. I agree, but how does it end? It says something better for us, which means what happened to them can also happen to us. Modern New Testament believers. Us, that's why the word us is there. In verse 40, Hebrews 11, 40. So the experience of the Old Testament saints can also happen be our experience where they had faith and they got killed and they were sawn into two, cut into two. All right. So uh, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, quoting that to say Jesus died and so we died. So we don't have to die. You know, that doesn't work. That is wrong teaching because clearly 11th chapter, two chapters down the line, we don't, we, we, we see the, uh, the real possibility of believers having to die. And then Hebrews 12, 4 is classic at, uh, where it says the, uh, the writer to the Hebrews, I, I believe it's Priscilla, where she says she has a complaint against these, these believers there. Okay, these, uh, the, the church there that she's addressing. They are, they are afraid of dying for Jesus and shedding blood and losing the life of Jesus. Some of them would rather deny Jesus and go back to the Jewish faith rather than you know, shedding their blood, being, being willing to shedding, to shed their blood and, and follow Jesus all the way till the end, even if it resulted in martyrdom. That's the message of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4. All right. So that uh, don't believe in the immortality cult. So we're looking at the letter A, the announcements of immortality in the New Testament, how these uh, cultic pastors twist it to teach something else. But the, if you carefully study the the, the passage in context, we understand that it's that that passage is talking about the real possibility of all of us are dying if it is God's will. Okay, and they quote two other verses, and I want to mention that and close. Okay, to, to announce immortality, and that is one is Second Timothy chapter one and verse ten. Second Timothy chapter one and one and verse ten. Okay, let's read Second Timothy chapter one and verse ten. And usually, when I put up a post. Uh, uh, on immortality they uh, these guys uh, will put this verse second timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 which says the sec, uh, second timothy 1 chapter 1 and verse 10 uh, okay, one more, I'm in first timothy second timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 and which now has been manifest through the appearing of our savior christ jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel so they say there you have it Apostle Paul says gospel brought life and immortality to life, uh, to us. How do you interpret 2 Timothy 1.10 which is commonly quoted by immortality on earth preachers? Okay. Read one verse above. Read the verse in context. Read the verse in context. Read one verse above. See, I cannot stress the importance of reading the Bible in context because some cults like uh, children of God and uh, uh, other cults uh, I do not even want to name them so they some of them believe in sexual immorality and they quote a verse in the book of uh, Acts chapter 2 maybe 44 or thereabout it says they all had everything in common so they quote that verse and say okay even wives we can have in common so can you imagine the depravity of the mind but that same book of Acts in Acts chapter 15 after the council they all formulate that believers should Stay away from sexual immorality. So the clear passage is ignored and they just pick a verse out of context and teach whatever they want to teach. And that is what this group is doing. The immortality on earth is doing. It's very, very dangerous what they teach. And here in, you cannot teach immortality on earth from based on 2 Timothy 1.10. 
uh, because verse 9 says, okay, uh, one verse above says, who saved us and called us to holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Okay, and the God, and, and verse, uh, verse 10, uh, and which now has been manifest to the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Okay, now you need to see that in context. And what is the context? Okay, verse 8 says, verse 8 says, Paul is a prisoner. Okay, Paul is a prisoner. And the context is the enemies of the gospel are trying to kill Paul. So what Paul is trying to say is, I am in prison right now. I may be killed, executed any time. So even if they die, this gospel which I preach will make me immortal. Meaning, even if I die, it gives me a place in heaven with Jesus. So that way I'm immortal. So don't read this verse 10 alone. Look at verse 8 above where it says Paul is a prisoner and effectively a, a, a prisoner waiting to die. So the message of first, Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.10 is, I'm a prisoner, I'm about to die and these people are threatening to kill me. But the gospel I preach, you know, will give me immortality in effect because even if I die, I will, I will once again be resurrected and I will reign the world with Jesus Christ. So that's the message here. It's not teaching immortality on earth. Okay, second, and if Paul taught immortality before the return of Jesus here, he will not be talking about his imminent death in, this, in, this, uh, in, in, his, in the same epistle. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. So if he believed in immortality on earth, he should be saying, come on, as believers, we will never die because Jesus died for us on the cross. He didn't say any of that sort. But instead, he said the exact opposite. He says, the time of my departure has come. The time of my departure has come. So 2 Timothy 1.10 does not, the announcement of immortality in 2 Timothy 1.10 does not teach immortality on earth. And finally, I want to close with this. Romans chapter 2 verse 7. Okay, Romans chapter 2 verse 7 is again another verse used. Okay, where it says, seek immortality. But that verse, you know, doesn't only say that. Okay, Romans chapter 2 verse 7. Okay, seek immortality. It says, to those who by patience and well-being seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. So the, the Chennai uh, cultic false teacher and pastor says, if immortality on earth is not, is, is not possible, why does Paul say seek immortality? Again, don't make a doctrine out of one verse. Okay, that, is, that would be my response. See one verse above. It says he will render to each one according to his works. So based on uh, Romans 2.6, do we teach salvation by works? Because it says he will render to each one according to his works. We see that in the context of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 where it clearly says we are saved by grace but having saved, been saved by grace we do good works so if we don't do good works because having moved by grace because we are grateful for grace then we can even then our salvation itself is in question so in that sense uh, you know we are stubbornly refusing to you know uh, do good works okay okay uh, Maybe that, that is the context of the works in Romans chapter 2 verse 6. So we need to understand Romans 2 6 and compare it with other passages that Apostle Paul has written and, the, and it's far more easier to understand. And here in Romans chapter 2 verse 7, it, he's, it not only talks about immortality, he talks about glory and honor and immortality. Okay, so what is my interpretation? Glory and only God is truly deserving of glory. Honor, only God is deserving of ultimate honor. Immortality, 1 Timothy 6.16 says, only God is immortal. Only God is immortal. So, what is Romans 2.7 effectively saying? See, seek after God who can give you, who can ultimately make you glorious who can ultimately honor you on the other side of eternity by giving you a place in heaven and saying, well done, good and faithful servant, and who will ultimately make you immortal. Okay, we need to interpret it in the light of other scriptures in the Bible. And 
1 Timothy 1.17, again Paul is addressing the same guy, Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.17 uh, says, To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So 1 Timothy 1.17 talks about immortality, honor and glory. It, it gives it to God. So you need to understand Romans 2, 7, which six, it says seek immortality. We need to understand it in the light of 1 Timothy 1, 17. So go to God. Don't seek the gift. Immortality is just a gift that God gives you. But seek God. This is the big problem with these false teachers. They teach you to pursue gifts when the, the whole message of the Bible is to pursue the giver. Seek God. Okay. And the overall message of the Bible is very clear. Okay. Uh, we may have to die on this side of eternity if the return of Jesus is delayed. But even if we die, it's fine. We need to be faithful till the end. We need to be faithful till the end. That's the message of the book of Revelation as well. Uh, even uh, We need to be ready to be even martyrs with Jesus. And uh, uh, the death of the righteous is precious in his sight. The death of the martyrs is precious in his sight. But he, he will one day reward us. So when it says seek immortality in Romans 2, 7, it's basically saying we need to understand it along with the other verse, 1 Timothy 1, 17, which says to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Which Im it there, that all the three qualities mentioned in Romans 7 is attributed to God. So seek God who in turn is able to give you all these things. All right. So let's interpret the Bible correctly. Let's not interpret according to our whims and fancies and follow all these false teachings. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Shall we pray? Would you decide now as you're listening to me to uh, decide to interpret the Bible in the right way? Use it as a, it's a sword, but that sword, if it's not used in the right way, it can be used for suicide. And that's what these false teachers are doing. They are leading people to spiritual, uh, to great danger, great spiritual danger by interpreting passages according to their whims and fancies. Young people do not like to hear about death, so they want to, they are looking for Bible passages which tells people they won't die and they come up with all these twisting of scripture passages. But the fact of the matter is we can and may die and we must be ready for death. And Jesus is the greatest preparation for death. If we are in Christ, we will not be condemned. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time you've given us. I pray that we will learn to rightly interpret Scripture. Lord, we will spend enough time in Scripture, read above the passage, read below the passage, ask uh, which chapter this is from, which book this is from, which part of the Bible is it from, which testament is it from, and then give a meaning a lot to the scriptures let us not violate the context of the scriptures and teach false teachings i pray for friends who are deceived by various false teachings like immortality on earth hyper grace prosperity hyper supernaturalism a lord jehovah witnesses and lord we have so many of them children of god i pray that they will all be rescued I'm praying that at least a remnant, a small group of people, five people, 10 people, 15 people, 20 people will be rescued even as, Lord, a small group of faithful Bible teachers will rise even among our, my hearers, oh Lord, people who will preach the truth of God's word. Even if it doesn't sound music like to people's ears, they'll preach the truth and hold on to the truth and they will live and they will complete their ministry without distract, without yielding to distraction so that they can hear your well done on that final day. We thank you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you're watching us for the first time and if you're not on my WhatsApp list, please send me a message via WhatsApp, uh, 888 I live in India, so that uh, country code will be 91. I would like to include you in my uh, one-way WhatsApp list uh, and I, you'll receive a lot more resources from our ministry. Uh, I would invite you to check our website, which is Duke Words. You, res you can read my recent articles uh, on uh, uh, handling cults. And uh, there's an appreciation about David Pawson. That's the latest article. And you'll find a lot of interesting stuff there. Bible Truth wrapped around cricket. 
So uh, take time to look at that. And our YouTube channel is uh, uh, YouTube slash C slash Visit Duke. If you would like to subscribe, uh, we would be very happy and encouraged. God bless you. If you're blessed with this teaching, please feel free to share it. And uh, we will also upload uh, another version of this message the, uh, recorded by Handicam with this uh, countryman Mike. Uh, we will also re re upload that onto our website shortly. Thank you. God bless you.